Imagine all your audio entertainment available in just one place. That's what the Audible app is all about. With Audible, you can always find the best of what you love or discover something new. Audible has an incredible selection of wellness titles and originals, like The Light Podcast by Michelle Obama, Work It Out by Mel Robbins, and Confidence Gap by Russ Harris. Membership includes access to Audible originals, podcasts, and tons of audiobooks that you can download or stream as much as you want. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title per month from an ever-growing catalog of titles to keep. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, whether you're traveling, working out, doing chores, wherever your day takes you. New members can try Audible now free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash motivation or text motivation to 500-500. That's audible.com slash motivation or text motivation to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. Hey, what's up? It's Ryan Shazier, former NFL linebacker and host of the podcast, Don't Call the Comeback. Football season is finally upon us. That means lots and lots of yelling, great conversations, and abundance of delicious food. There's nothing like a good game day food tradition. I love grilling. And on Sundays, me and my family love eating Oscar Mayer beef franks. It honestly can't get more classic than that. But you know game day can't stop with just one food. I love making cheeseburgers topped with some extra melty craft singles. And you have to get a little fancy with it by adding jalapenos and crispy onions. I'm getting hungry even thinking about it. <laughs> I love sharing game day food traditions with my friends and family. Now is your turn to show off your tasty game day food traditions. Go to www.gamedayfoodtraditions.com to share a photo of your game day food traditions to enter to win $10,000. Once again, that's www.gamedayfoodtraditions.com to enter to win $10,000. This is Full Change with Tom Laidlaw. The hell with the laddie. Oh my gosh. All right, laddie. We're recording now, laddie. It's my Irish accent. So, Tom, it's a, it, w- it was going to be a great week, but uh, we, the Rangers Alumni Association get together this weekend, but you got COVID. Yes. And then they got rained out. They got Larry Mel like sounded like a hissy fit. The saga continues. The ego. So, first of all, I think people who think differently about this, but obviously, I think it's so he wanted to come and stay here for like a month. And, uh, did he say a month though? I mean, it was a month, it was five days, but like it wasn't, I don't do that. Like I don't go out and stay at people's houses unless it's a uh, family or something. But you don't go anywhere. I, what do you know, go anywhere? You been to Fiji? You been to Australia? Well, that was on the television show. See, I don't go anywhere. What if you had a friend that you play on the Rangers with and you stayed at their house? What if, for instance, oh, I would, that's the thing, I would not go to What if like Allison lived in Melbourne? Would you be like, Hey Mike, I'm going to stop by your house for a couple of days. Is that cool? No, I wouldn't say that to him. No. Really? Yeah. See, I'm going to stay in a hotel the next yeah. town over. No, maybe the same town. I'd say the hotel. I'd still see him. Like last time Larry's in town probably was like 20, 25 years ago. And I would be he's in a hotel for it might be an ice hockey Harlem oh. event or something. Okay. I can't where it was. But he stayed in a hotel, they'd put him up there. So he wanted to get together. So I went and picked him up. Sure. Had, had lunch together and spent the day together. It's fine. But this to have somebody I think it's just very strange for somebody to stay at your place. Maybe he incorrectly assumed that you would be welcoming since you have a, a you know, a palatial three bedroom uh oh. condo here in Greenwich. You know, so it's, but it's, and you live it's, alone, but it's a privacy thing. So I'm out in public a lot. Yes. Speaking to people all the time. You're like, you've seen how jovial I am. Charming. Or, or jovial. I've seen you be jovial. jovial. Not jovial. Charismatic. Yeah. Charming. All those things. Right. Yes. I mean, I don't mean to say that about myself. That's what people say. No, that's, that's the word on the street. Okay. Yeah. So when I go home, it's like, okay, this is my time. You need to unwind because you're, you're giving away all your good energy to, yeah. to the world. That's a very good point. But now you have to just recharge that battery. Right. 330. The alarm goes off. Out at 3.52, breaking other people's lives. Listen, so, and just so people know, so as soon as we finish um, taping our episodes, Tom's out the door. And not even out the door, he's pushing me out the door. So, I, I had a conversation, a woman called me, and I was on the phone for two hours with her. And, wow, that's oh, that's long for you. Oh, long. It's a lifetime. It is a lifetime. That's two hours I will never get back. Well, we, we, as everyone listening knows, we do a show together, and we so we have to talk a lot on the phone about things and booking and schedule. And when Tom gets to the four minute mark of the phone call, he starts to fade fast. Uh, see, we're good friends, so, so we got to the point now where I just say, to him, "Okay, I'm done." That's with it. I'm, I'm done. done. Yeah, that's it. I, I'll, I'll even tell you, I'll say, "Are right, you done? Aren't you?" You're like, "Yep." And my, my sons and I are the same way. I love my sons, and that's Shane and Cody. Uh, they're adult men now, thirty three and thirty years old, and we have this running joke that we only spent like they come over. There's like a limit, like a two hour time. 
She just said the timer on your phone. All right, guys, that's it. Time to go. His dog Maverick, right? My grandson's yes, dog. Her, who pees on you every time oh, I see you. God, he's the same way now. Like he'll come in all excited to see me peeing up. I'm still getting those golden showers from the dog. Yeah, crying and crying and everything. And within 15, 20 minutes, he goes and sits by the door. He wants to sleep. It's like, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. <laughs> Human grandpa. It's a laid law family trait. I was thinking back to the other day when we were, I was still married, young kids, dog, cat, a whole bit. And we were moving from Michigan. No, no, no. It was from California to Michigan. Uh, so I was still in the Asian business. Yes. 22 years. And uh, we, for some reason, there was a lapse there. We didn't have any place to stay. So we went and stayed at my parents' home. With the oh, dog and the cats, the whole bit for like yeah, two, yeah. two weeks. And I thought back about that now. I'll never forget. So we had left. We forgot something. We got 20 minutes. We had to turn around and come back. My parents had the music going. They're dancing around with the vacuum screen. As soon as you left. Going down there. They didn't, and they, I stood there at the door for a second. They didn't know it was there. It was hilarious because they were probably like, oh, thank God. 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 It's mad. Oh, no. Well, that's funny. I, I go, go laid laws. Yeah. So. Again, we said earlier that this was the uh, this week was the alumni golf outing, which is a great event. Right. Um, I had so you don't play golf because you're terrible at it. Yeah, but you are like you're the fun time Charlie guy who just hangs out with foursomes. I know you're with my buddy Ryan O'Malley and his dad. You were there for some last year. Oh, okay, that's oh yeah, yeah. They, I play hockey with him. He's like a, a stud player on our men's league team. Oh, okay. Him and Andrew Sar. But they, uh, but yeah, Ryan O'Malley said uh, they're like Laidlaw's great. He had such a blast with my dad and I. It was a lot of fun. Well, I try to do is everybody gets a nickname. Okay. We, we were we had a group probably like three or four years ago. Great guys, and uh, the I can't remember. I called everybody wrestling. I did, one of the guys in the group was a wrestler, so everybody now got wrestling nicknames. You know, like the Hulk, you know, right? Sure. sure. There's one guy we called him Ric Flair. So we're the old day. We're like, woo, you know, right, nice. Yeah. So I didn't. They were begging me to take a shot at the last hole. We had like a thirty foot putt, <laughs> so they wanted me to do it. So I, now I'm getting Mr. Cocky. I'm thinking, like, okay, I'll show you one time. One time. Wait, have you ever played golf? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Hey, no pleasure whatsoever. Got it. So I, I'm being really cocky. I said, okay, I'm going to show you guys one time how to do this. You line it up, you step up, hit the ball. That's it. It's not that complicated. So I actually do that. goes right home. You did not sink the putt. Yeah, no, you I sank did. a 30 foot yeah, putt. Totally, I, I know how I did it. Get out of here. Really? This, this one tiny guy, uh, I go run it over to him like I'm going to chest. Wait, hold on, hold on. Tiny, because you're definitely a high bully. We know that you're a size bully. So he's, he's, he's smaller. About 5'10? Five, 5'10, ten. Five, ten, yeah, like 140 pounds or something like that. That's a, okay, yeah. that is, yeah, yeah that's, like that's a little, he's the smaller man. That's a Celt, you know, yeah. life. So I go run it over to him like I'm going to chest bump. The look in his eyes are like, no. <laughs> so did you do it? No. Uh, it was is that on video anywhere? You got that, that fight? I think we might have. I think his wife might have got that whole video. Kids, well, if she's listening, please send it in. We'd love to We'd love to see that. Oh, yeah. so I do think, you know what? That's the thing. I do have fun. You know, I get with the group, but usually those charity things, it's not really that serious, right? People go, although some of the guys are pretty good. Uh, so you're having fun out there. See, and I'm, I admit, we can't golf at all. And so I'm now, I'm now critiquing everybody else's game as we yep. go on. No, Ryan and his dad said they had a blast with you. They said it was a great time. I think, and I guess that was two years or a year ago. And the good thing that this will, a bad thing for you gets canceled is that Craig Patrick, they're going to honor him. Right. So Craig was a general manager for, I think it was six years. And, and be- beloved guy, like no oh, en- no enemies in the game. What right? a great man. What a great man. I've told the story here. You, they tell you the story was Dr. Speedo in practice. That, that I don't think you did. You told us about his his guy who they brought in from the University of France, the fake doctor. Yeah, doctor. But, so Craig, I had this thing. We did this at Eddie Hospital. Our, our game one time too, where we shoot the pucks to their feet. Yep, it's, it's pointless when it's just kind of funny. You know, it's a childish little game. So uh, we're in practice one day at right play land, and I'm shooting the puck at Craig. Now the idea is you're not supposed to let that know that it's you, but everybody, everyone knows it's Eddie Law. So Craig's making doing a crossover going around the corner. I didn't mean to do it. He sniped him. The skate, the one foot that he was standing on slid out oh, underneath. No. Oh God, he landed and hit his eye. Is he wearing a helmet? Uh, I don't think he was. No, he hit his eye on the ice. It got a black eye. Hey, Joe, I have to go to a meeting in the city after practice late night. It was, what? Well, it was ones I didn't intend for that. Did you like, apologize profusely? Oh, yeah, I did. That's, that's Greg. I'm sorry, but he was such a good guy. He just, yeah, what? He still is a great guy. I saw him recently. The Rangers had us go in for a game in uh, Pittsburgh. He was there. And we had dinner together with some fans. Oh, yeah, he's living in Pittsburgh. Yeah. yeah. I know he's involved with free ice, yep. too. Yeah. He, I'll tell you what. Great general manager too. I don't think people because he's quiet. You know, he yeah, talk about stuff. But he um so even like going into uh, to Pittsburgh where they won their cups there uh, at that stretch. Yep, with Ronnie Francis. Yeah, the nineties. Yep. He, you know, I'm really re- respected about him. He brought in Scotty Bowman and um Bob Bob Johnson. Bob Johnson. Yep. Now most guys wouldn't do that because those are two powerful person. Oh yeah. As you start to think, okay, I'm going to lose my job. Yep. These guys, but he he knew. I think he was confident enough in his abilities and his job to bring in the right people, and they won. So I, I, I Craig was a great general manager. He's just so quiet. 
you just don't realize you know, he's not that bombastic. No, he's uh, very well loved and respected. Yeah. I don't know how he got onto that subject, but that's great. It's not a Craig Patrick show. We're, we're going to talk about fighters. But first, it was a good weekend for my my the team I coach, the Saints. They they split, but they got their first W of the season in this young season. So there's nothing like my So are you a head coach or? No, I don't want to be a head coach ever. Uh, Andy, head coach, I'd like to be an assistant coach with Brian. We let the kids. I want to be like the, the old uh, wise giving advice guy. I don't want to be the X's and O's guy. I'm done with that. Yeah, but is there a whole lot of X's and O's? Well, it's don't put the puck in the middle. Right. Look up and move your feet. That's basically yeah. it. You know, so it's a coach. I don't know where they want to. Oh, okay. So anyway, I, I, uh, we got to win. And my my little guy got the game winner. So nice. Tom was very excited to to get the game winner. You know, it's my hockey's fun. It's the it's probably the best age. They did play the Saturday game. They played against the team, and this team had this big kid from Russia. He was I think he's been here like a year, and he just was skating around oh, everybody, oh. bigger than everybody, and just scored all the goals. So he beat. But it's so much, might hockey is so much fun. I wish it could be this way forever. I know it's not going to be, but it's just so much fun. Yeah, you know, it is too. Because you're, you don't say to yourself, you've got to be perfect. Don't you? you got to do everything right. It's just like, go ahead, we'll play. Move, move your feet. Yeah. And don't pass in the middle. It's just like have the passion for the game, right? I can't say that enough. I know you know this already. It's just that passion. It's such a huge thing. It can take, it can get taken away from player, player yourself. Oh, sure. Especially by, like we've talked about this before with the parents, like just the parents so far, pretty good. Um, we got great kids. Uh, we got, uh, we got, we have Bryce and Connor and Carter is our goalie, but we have this one little girl, Charlotte, who is just, it's everybody, no fear. And she just goes out and just checks people. And even, she's even doing things like when the, the big rush was, was going around us, she'd skate up to him and she'd like be jamming out his skates and trying to like, I'm like, what are you, what are you doing? I'm like, it's great. It's not great, but yeah. Because they're not supposed to say it at all, right? No, 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 that's right. So what do the referees do? They, well, they don't, no, no penalties. Well, we're in two leagues, the full ice league, there's penalties, but the half ice league, and what that means they they split the ice. Parents listening would know they split the ice down the middle. You play half the ice, but they just send you off if you get a penalty, oh, and then yeah. they, you change. But uh, it's great to just see these kids and, and the passion they have and the fun they're having with it. So hopefully they you know like. How do you like the half ice? I don't like it. Oh yeah. No, I, I mean I guess it's good because they get more touches, but right. it, it, it's a big when they go to full ice. It's really difficult because they it, there's offsides, there's icing, they have to skate more. But you know they're eight, so yeah. they're having fun. And what do you think the main reason for the half ice is just the ice time itself? Like I think cost. partially, partially, yeah, you split, you split the cost, but I think it's more touches. I think oh. they get, they get, yeah. cause it's almost like the small, when you coach, you did the small ice battles. So you're getting more touches on the puck. Yeah. I can see both, right? Cause you got to think quicker out there since it's a small so ice surface. Haven't they? So yeah. I think what they should do is I think six and under, and then the first year of my, it's a seven year, seven year old year should be half ice and the eight year should be full, all full ice. Right. But you got to make that transition the next year anyway. You know? It's the same thing. It's hitting. You can't hit two at 14. Now. I think it's high school. Yeah. I, I guess I see the point because you don't want kids to get hurt. You, you, do, you know, exactly. But they, yeah. they don't they don't know how to hit and get hit right. by the time they're 14. So now you go into those teen years where the kids are just wild, right? They, they want to wild. hit somebody. Yeah, I, I, st I, was, I was stopped by the rink yesterday. They were having a, I guess it was a 15U or a 14U game, and they, the kids were big. <laughs> they were hitting. And right. So there was, there was a lot going on. We talked about this before. You think fighting is going to be out of the game entirely at some point? I, yeah, definitely. I just think that you're, you're bare knuckle boxing. And with the concussions and the CTE and the injuries, I think it's going to, and it's, it's kind of winding down. I mean, you're going to have to, yeah. so we're going to have a, a guest on today who was a Ooh, tough guy. Oh God, I would not want to fight. You know, we have, scary, we have Scott, the sheriff Parker coming up, but he, and what a great thing. You're, you know, you're a cowboy at heart and he's the, the sheriff and he had that beard, but that was an era when they were fighters and they were a lot of, yeah, they were one dimensional. Yeah, big guys who would knock people out. Not like people. When I played, they're really it wasn't a whole lot of knockouts. I mean, Clark, Clark Gillies hurt yep. Eddie Hospital, but it was a knockout. But Clark Gillies is a whole fan hockey player. Yeah. There's some big guys, but yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember that game. I think sure that people get knocked out, but man, it's, it wasn't like, you know, Parker, Colt Moore, Twitz Harkner, big guys, Beauregard, Tony, Tony Twist. Oh, like no. these are some monsters. John, here. Scott. John Scott. She's, it was, I'll never forget the funny video. Uh, somebody else on the Buffalo team with John Scott was playing for Buffalo. Got it, a fight or something like that. Lost his helmet. And the helmet must have got broken. Okay. Uh, so they, they give him Scott Parker's helmet. The kid, it was a joke to give him Scott Parker. It, didn't, it was like he spun it around on his head. Oh, no. Parker's really. head was so big. Wait, Scott, John Scott or Scott Parker? No, I'm sorry. I apologize. John Scott. John Scott. Yeah, yeah John Scott. Oh, he had the big melon. Maybe my, my helmet. Well, he was what, six, seven? Oh, six, eight, huge guy. Yeah. His head fit the rest of his body. But some other fighters, too, in that, that era, you know, who were just massive guys were like, well, Stu Grimson was a big yeah. guy. Yeah. Uh, trying to think who else. Dave Brown was Dave Brown. Yeah. Now you're going back in front of Dave yeah. Brown. Well, I think well, they did. Brown. He was pretty tough. Yeah. Donald Brashear, yeah. another tough guy. Dave Sabanko was Sabanko. George LaRock. George LaRock, yeah. He was, he's like, he's kind of like that gentleman. He was that video too where he, That's great. He's fighting the guy in Phoenix. Right? Yeah. 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 So, would you like to go? Okay. Thank you, Bill Joe. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> him saying that to you, you're about to fight him, you're going, that's great. Right, here you go. Here's this, this guy who's just going to pummel you. So that was the fight. Hey, yeah, the old Dave Smigel story for me. When he, I hit Wayne uh, in the Edmonton, and it was like a two, random Tuesday night game. I was playing for the Rangers at the time. And it really wasn't a rivalry because we sure played there later. Yeah. So back in those days, uh, once a whistle blew, the building went dead quiet. There's no music getting played or whatever it was. So I hit Wayne and uh, Sather, his coach at the time, he, uh, Sather, he stands up on the bench, like one foot on the bed, yeah, yeah. on boards as I leave. Laidlaw, you're going home in a body bag. Sather said that. Yep. Oh, wow. Now the whole building can hear this, right? right. Both benches and everything. And then he taps the Samanko on the shoulder, sends him out. And this is in between uh, play, right? So the, it, oh, boy. he's skating over toward me. Uh, and of course, we've lost Dave. He's passed away. Uh, but I mean, it's well recorded. He had a, a drinking problem. Sure. Um, so he's coming over to me, even knowing hold on. I swear it looked like he was out in the woods or something like that. <laughs> Hair sticking up. Wild man. Oh, yeah. And I'm, yeah, I'm looking at him. I'm thinking, is he hung over or what's it? Right. He's coming over to me, kind of like this disgusted look. Like he's, he, he just, like I said, there's no rivalry. I got to beat you up now. Yeah, exactly. He comes, and he does. He comes over to me and he gets right up in my grill. And I, yeah, yeah. And uh, he says, Tommy, are you going to hit Wayne anymore tonight? Yeah. Really? Dave, if you don't want me to hit him, I won't hurt him. <laughs> and you'd have to throw with him? <laughs> throw him. Now, now if, just tactically, if a big guy like that grabs you, you just hang on, right? You just grab his arms and just yeah, try to hold on. But, you know, you, you sh- really, the real good fighters will tell you this, you got to throw punches back to try to stop him from coming sure. in. But obviously, then that's a hand that you don't have to hold on to him. With, right. right. And, most guys in those days were all right-handed fighters. So your left hand, you'd reach in. It, it's you, grabbing it. Yeah. So you'd reach in at the elbow of the jersey. Yep. Yeah. But the good fighters would either make it so loose that he can just pull right out of it ah, I got or it's so tight you couldn't grab it. And Smeiko was that kind of guy. So it was one of those things that, listen, if you're not a real fighter, you yeah, know, yeah. But, well, here's, and legend has it that Wayne has a long memory. My friend Randy Velichek told us that. Yeah. I back got him. But did Wayne, when you got to LA, was Wayne like, hey, Laidlaw, we gave a cheap shot to Edmonton. Yeah, because again, it wasn't a cheap shot. It was just a clean hit. Okay, Laidlaw, you blasted me in Edmonton. Yeah. Why'd you do that? Well, but again, he then saw what Seether did. So he was like, oh, okay, what are you going to do now? No, right, yeah, so that's, and Wayne would never. I mean, we were, we were teammates, but on the ice, even uh, although I played against him, we were kids, so we knew each other. Oh, did you really? Yeah, that is fair. We don't know. Hold on a second now. There's, you know, they, they, I'm peel another layer of the onions. Jeez, so I was playing junior B hockey at Bramley Blues, and uh, so I was, I was, I think he was like two years younger than me, or two or three years younger. Okay. So I was a young player playing. I think it was only like uh, 16, maybe 17 at the most. And Wayne was such a good player uh, that they, they would be playing up. Yeah, high levels. And we already knew about him. He was a great player. So I remember it, all our goal was is just to run this kick. And that was really was great there. Oh yeah, totally. And uh he was funny that here's a great uh, so nothing really happened in that game. It's just sorry, but when I got treated to LA that he came to LA after, uh, we were getting on the bus and training camp and we, yeah, back then they had six pack, you know, sure. the yep. beers and everything. So he grabs a six pack and there's only him and I on the bus at that point. He come walking to the back of the bus and I'm thinking, Oh god, I'm gonna get treated or something you know, like right, right. Because he wasn't like that, but that's kind of the view you had of him. There's his, his power. So he goes to the back of the bus and he starts telling stories about the guys I played with in junior B. I couldn't remember these guys, but Wayne could remember, remember who they were, how they played. And I'm looking at him going, how do you remember? That's just who he was. Yeah, like, yeah. He studied the game so much. It was, it was amazing. That's one of many stories. About Wayne. Well, you know, it's funny. To, now, I'm not an NHL player, though. I, you know, I, I, in my head, I am. But I went, so I, when I met Wayne on the Howard Stern show, this is back in the 90s. I saw him. We did, we did a show. I wrote an interview yeah. with him. Yeah. Great. It's funny. Everyone can look it up on YouTube. It's great. Then I saw him. Many, uh, maybe 17, 18 years later. And he's like, hey, remember me? I was like, no, that was great. But I'm like, wow, How would you, that's incredible. You remember? I think I told you before. I just think he was so aware of his presence. Yeah. Uh, not just for the game, but who he was, like his brand and everything. Yeah. It's amazing. But he was like that when he was like 12 years old. Or he just realized, okay, this is, I want to be the best player that's ever played the game. Here's how I'm going to conduct myself. So we're talking about a guy who's never fought or fought twice, as I famous on how I tried to fought Neil Broughton. And I think one, maybe Dave Taylor. But now we go to someone who fought a lot. In Ooh. today's episode, is the sheriff Scott Parker? Scary dude. I'm glad we are doing it uh, remotely, so I don't have to face him one on one. There you go. All right, Tom. We got a, a great guest today. You always want to be a cowboy growing up, but we got a guy who went by the sheriff, had an epic beard, won a Stanley Cup, and fought all the heavyweights in the league. We have Scott the Sheriff Parker. Wow. So glad we're doing this remotely because if I do something to get him mad, it's a scary dude. How you doing there, brother? Great to meet you. Hey, thanks for having us, having me on. I really appreciate it, you guys. My pleasure. You had a great career. I tell you, you were uh, you fought all the heavyweights, right? That was the time where Probert and all those kind of guys were, were playing. We was. There was it was the rough and tumble days. I mean, yeah, you went to a hockey or you went to a fight in a hockey game broke out mentality, and uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. That was back when you had one ref too. You didn't have two. Yeah. 
Uh, you didn't get, yeah, one rep and two ladies, and you can get away with a lot more. So, yeah. And everybody, you know, it's hard enough for people to watch the game now to understand how, like, violence was part of the strategy of the game, right? It's like you, the intimidation. What the, where'd you grow up? Where's home? Actually, I was born in California uh, when I was six years, five, six years old. My dad was a state game warden in California and then went federal, so we transferred to Alaska. So that's where I started playing hockey. And when I was in, I think, second or third grade, got a piece of paper that says learn how to play hockey. And I didn't know what hockey was and never heard of it. And I didn't want to be the kid in class that didn't know what it was. So I went home to my parents and I handed it to them saying, what's hockey? <laughs> you know, can I play? Yeah. And, you know, they knew a little bit because uh, I think the Kings were the only ones back in the day in Cali. There wasn't the Ducks or the, uh, the Sharks. Yeah. But, That's right. you know, they, uh, you know, the Kings and, and I know you played played there as well. So, uh, and we'll talk more about that down the road. But, uh, you know, it just started that way. And then uh, got some gear, you know, whole family got ice skates and up in alaska there's outdoor rinks everywhere so no you just bring a shovel and your own pucks and uh you old school hockey it so just learned how to play that way and worked my way from house teams to you know comp teams and and just kept working my way up the up the ladder you know it's funny a lot of people don't realize if, if a guy like you that's a fighter i mean you still play the game obviously they think well geez was he fighting when he was seven years old but if you don't you don't fight at seven years old you just play hockey that Exactly. Yeah. It's like anything. It's it, not really until I grew four inches in one summer when I was 15 years old, uh, huh. everybody wanted to pick on the big guy or put yeah. people on me. And I always, you know, I went to Sunday school as a kid and you always, you know, told, you know, keep your hands to yourself. Scott, did you play with those guys from Alaska, like the Dubinskys and Scott Gomez? Were they in your circle? Gomer. Oh, I love Gomer. He, he's awesome. Him and his dad, Carlos. And uh, yeah, we were really close. And I lived in Eagle River, so it was outside of Anchorage where most of those guys played. So I was always on different teams playing against those guys. But and it's still the brotherhood, you know, playing against them all those years. And uh, I know Gomer, Gomer was the first one to win a cup with the, with the Devils, took it back to Alaska, and that was cool to see. So, yeah, just, just the history of it. And I know a few more guys have come out of there since. Uh, but back in the day, there was, you know, the scouting wasn't like it is now. I mean, they had to travel up there to go see us. You weren't, you know, videotaping anything and sending it to scouts or anywhere. So it was boots on the ground and just watching the kids play. And now, were you a good player right away? One of the best kids? No, I wouldn't say I was one of the best kids, but I think my work ethic and just, you know, my parents teaching me, you know, all those, you know, life lessons when you're little, uh, just, you know, be a good winner, be a good loser, all those little things that kind of add up to the big picture. And, uh, live vicariously through their kids and they wanted it more than the kid did and my parents were like you want to play cool at what it's it's up to you so that was always kind of cool that i had my own you know uh option on what i wanted to do and you know luckily up in alaska we had the dividend check from the oil revenue the oil pipeline so we would get money every year for being residents and that's what i would put towards hockey so um you know, all my friends had toys and quads and dirt bikes, and I always wanted one. And my dad said, well, you can play hockey or if you want to buy, buy yourself one of those. And I always just wanted to play hockey. So it just panned out. It's amazing. All the guys we interview, most of them are all the same way. It's, it, the parents did not push them. They just said, listen, if you want to do it, it's your thing. You've got to go get it done. My parents are like that too. It's like, I don't ever remember getting pushed. And I think it's better that way, right? Because now you've got the passion for the game, not somebody else, not your parents. Exactly. Well, you also look back too and see the sacrifices your folks went through. You know, getting you up at five in the morning to get you to the rink at five thirty to, you know, you know they want to be able to sleep in. You know, they're they're both working back in the day, and you know they really sacrificed to make my dream a reality. And those are the things you look back on. And, and it is a team effort when it comes to the family process. But you know, not having them push you or living vicariously through you, it made it a lot funner and a lot better in, a lo in the long run. So did, what did you go play? Did you play junior hockey? I did, up in Kelowna, British Columbia. I've actually played a year of junior B hockey in Spokane. Um, kind of a funny story. My parents had just moved. Well, we had all just moved down from Alaska. So everything was a lot different. Um, you know, I basically, when you're that age, you think, oh, my, my life's over and all my friends are here. Not realizing you go to different places and, uh, you know, you get new friends in, in those places. So, sure. um, you know, spent a year in Spokane. Uh, Got in a couple fights. I'd never been in a fight in my life on the ice. Uh, oh. Literally the first time he dropped their mitts. It was a 20-year-old. I was 16. And he just drops his mitts and starts pummeling me. And 
I'm looking over at the bench, you know, my gloves still on, and I'm just dumbfounded, like, what's going on? They're like, drop your mitts and hit him, drop your mitts and hit him. So that that instance, I, my, my, my switch flipped, and I did, I dropped my mitts and I grabbed him, and I don't think I even threw a punch. I just basically lifted him off the ground and started slamming him on the ground, like, like, <laughs> and then, like threw him away, and then looked over at the bench, like, good, are we good? Like, was that okay? And they were like, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that'll do. That'll do. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. That'll do that. And you get the point across. So that oh, was my first funny. hockey fight. I didn't even think I threw a punch. I just, you know, flipped the switch and just figured, like, oh, look, look what I can do. That's but funny. yeah. So, but you're, but you're a good player at this point. Don't, you're not just going to be a fighter at that point. You're a good player. Oh no, no, no. I mean, I mean, who, who wants to be on the fourth line? Scratched all the time. We all want to be on the first line, you know, with the good players, and you want to, you want to be, be a part of the win in all, all aspects, and. uh uh, I mean, yeah, scoring and just being a, a big player out there and just doing your job, um, I think is a big part of it. Even in juniors, my last year in juniors, I think I had 30 goals, 22 assists, 250 pims, and I thought, I can't wait to get the next level and just do the same thing there. And, you know, I got uh, you know, drafted the second time to Colorado in 98 and um, basically didn't uh, – I played 27 games up that year in 98, but mainly at Hershey, you know, I had Mike Foleno and Jay Wells as my coach down there, and you know they let me play. It was awesome. he's a good guy. We played we played together out in LA there. Yeah, he's a hard he's a hard, man. He's a hard man too, right? Very, yeah, very very. But that that's the stuff that you you can respect though, because if the coach has that drive desire that passes on to the players, and you want to win for that coach, you know, even Mike Foleno, great guy. Um, yeah. uh, just the opportunities they give you is really a big part of it. You know, being on the power player, just consistently being out there. And just showing your worth and what you're able to do. And I think, um, I can't remember how many points I had that year, but then the whole 99 season, Bob Hartley wanted to punish me because he was a douchebag. So <laughs> uh, basically, it kept me at Hershey the whole year. And I think I had 19 goals or something like that. I mean, I scored a lot and I, I did my job. Um, and I just said, I can't wait to get to the next level and do it there. And it just really didn't pan out the way I thought. Hold on. So why would, why was he being a douchebag? Why was he punishing you? Bob always had something against guys that I don't know either fought or you know he thought he knew the job as, as well. But you know, being a junior B goalie and doing what he did in the league, I don't think he ever been in a fight in his life. And he's trying to tell me how to do my job, and I can't respect a guy like that because yeah. you know if he'd been there, done that, if he'd been in the trenches, and if he did, you know, had the careers like you guys did back in the eighties and nineties, you know, I can respect a guy like that, like Trotzier. I love Trotz because he he went he was there, you know he he, he was in the in the, in the trenches and in all those cups and in, in, in the island, you know that's a guy you can respect. But Bob, he just always wanted certain things done, and it's like that doesn't make sense. Why would I do that? Doing doing things that are out of the norm of what you think hockey would be, and uh, and just all his little his little you know snippets and like you know. Works. You like the smell of chocolate so much. I send you to Hershey. It's like, well, you're a douche. Oh God, God. that's just a bit. Well, that's we'll break him in a nutshell. So yeah, enough about him. We don't want to give him any. Okay. Uh, let's back up for a sec. You didn't play major junior hockey. I, I did in Kelowna, British Columbia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of skipped that. I went from junior B to the. No, 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 it's fine. I, I you know what's my fault because I thought it was, I didn't re- realize that the Kelowna was in the major junior hockey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. But yeah. Scott was also drafted twice, which is yeah, not a deal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, did, couldn't come to an agreement with uh, New Jersey, uh, unfortunately. But you know they were they were doing Wait. really well back in the day. But got... do you mean it was hard to negotiate with Lou Lamarillo? Is that what you're saying? Oh, that would yeah, definitely. I mean, Lou, yeah, he, he's you know trying to get get me for cheaper, and I was like, well, this guy got this, and this is I mean, this is before arbitration and before the CBAs and before you had all this stuff kind of set in stone. But yeah, they were a little difficult to deal with. But I knew that. You know, in juniors, I was just going to tear it up next year anyway. I mean, it was my league to basically lose was, you know, like all the fights I had, you know, it was, you know, everybody wanted to try to take me out. But I just felt like I was a man among boys at that point. And, you know, I was like, nothing's going to happen. And that was my mentality was, you know, this is just a stepping stone to get to the next level. And, you know, I can't wait until it happens. Who are some of the other tough guys in the Western League at that time? Because that's a tough league itself, right? Very, yeah. I mean, you had, well, you had like Dale Parrington back in the day. Uh, okay. Yeah. So Dale was there. Uh, you had Reed Lowe, Rocky Thompson, uh, Wade Belak, Graham Belak. Um, oh my God. Uh, Rob Skurlak. Um, 
Actually, <laughs> Zeno Chara, uh, oh, big he was, he was, Yeah, yeah, he wasn't like crazy tough, but he was just a big guy. I was like, "Who's this guy in Prince George?" You know, thinking, you know, I was like, "Oh, let me see what he's all about." It was funny back in the days. He he would instead of like throwing punches, he played like whack a mole because <laughs> of the way he fought. Because he was like any of us, you don't know until you do it enough times, and you're like, "Well, that didn't work, so I'm going to try something different." And you know, that was Big Z. So. Yeah, Zeno, uh, I mean, holy, there was quite a few back in the day. I mean, basically every team had two to four guys that would throw down pretty much every night. So you had that famous stance that you would take in the NHL with the, before you got into the fight, right? Your arms are up like a boxing stance, right? I did, yeah. It just It's just what worked for me, you know, having the distance and being able to feel that out. And, you know, if somebody was to grab my arm, I could still escape or I could still maneuver the way I wanted to, but... When you're just really tight and you're in, in close, then you can just get hit that much quicker. So I always felt, I think even one of the commentators says, look at Parker's arm. It's like this, like the length of a fishing pole. So I had to stretch them out. My big strength too was just my grip strength. It was just once I got a hold of you, you never really got away. So, so okay, so now you're known as a fighter, but obviously you still have to be able to play the game to be in the National Hockey League and be a fighter. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Did you feel, did you feel pretty good about your game? I did, but even breaking onto the abs, you know, we had such a good team. You know, even breaking onto the fourth life, and it was hard most nights because we were so stacked. So I was just, you know, happy enough to be in the lineup and be able to do my job. And, you know, it was a little tough, you know, when I'm used to playing in, you know, 10, 12, 15 minutes a game. And then I'm playing one shift. You know, I'm out there at 30 seconds. And there was actually a game back in the day where I didn't even get one shift, so I didn't get credited the game. But that was also Bob's mind games. But uh, it's just, you know, a little bit different when you can't really be out there to be proactive and really do your job and, and kind of be that powerhouse. I always had to do a deal with stuff after the fact. So that was kind of different to learn, um, you know. Yeah, I don't think people understand how tough that is, right? No, very tough. I mean, sitting in a lion cage, basically you're just waiting and you're fuming and your feet are throbbing because your skates are tied, but you have to be on the ice and, hours i mean it's not easy and then mentally you're just running scenarios through your head if this happens i do that or there was one time when i remember pete warrell hit dead marsh by our bench and i just lost it i grabbed deader off the ice and put him on the bench and just jumped the board i was like i'm done with it so like i just started doing my own things too because like it's just what needed to be done and yeah. you know it's sometimes you have to take care of the things right when it happens and not 10 shifts later and they'll be like what's that all about so, and it's like you know, the game now today, and I don't blame the guys, the guys are great athletes to play now, but there's this big thing, right? If there's a big hit, somebody on the team that got hit has to feel like they have to jump in right away. And they're really not even good at their job. And they're all wearing masks. And I feel bad. It's like, yeah, I mean, a lot of the stuff was just planting the seed back in the day. It was just like, yeah. you touch my good player, I'm going to break your best player's leg. And then he's going to hate you because you created that, that to happen. So what I would do right on the bench, I would just go to my guy and just point it you know, their best player be like, this guy's going to get it because you're being a douchebag. So quit it. And then the other guy would go, leave him alone. Like, quit doing that. I don't want my leg broke. <laughs> Scott, can you give us an example of somebody you said that to and how they reacted? Uh, well, it was like Sean Avery. Like, he, I think it was even exhibition. And I was just like, you know, hey, just quit running around. Like, dude, this is exhibition. Like, don't make me have to do my job because you're a donkey. So, you know, I just go right over the plant. I'm just like, you know, calm the shit down. For one, it's exhibition. And two, like, we're going to make the teams. We're good. So just, you know, you know. Let's not have to do this right now. It's not even going to count, so let's let's not go there. And well, just things like that. And there'd be times where I would just wait in the in the in the hallway and just tell guys, you know, I'm going to break your ankle. I don't like you. Oh yeah, like all right. Well, when they get off their buses, you know, I'd be kicking the, the soccer ball or doing whatever, and I'd be like, well, you're in trouble tonight. You just plant the seed. And I may never get a ship. I may never play against that guy. But if I can get that in their head that I may take them out or I may be against them or I may do something and maybe I get in their head enough to where they do nothing that night against our team. And that's where the whole, I think it's, you know, 80% mental and 20% physical is if you slip the body down and the mind down, then nothing really happens. But, you know, it's just playing that seed and being like, you know, there is a consequence tonight, boys. So walk around and find out. Yeah. And that does work too. I'm telling you like, we had, remember Nicky Fatiu? You ever see some oh, fight? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was actually a coach in uh, yeah, uh, Kentucky back in the day. Oh, okay. Oh, God, yeah. Well, he would do, uh, he was jacked pretty good, too. He was in good shape. 
and he'd uh, at Madison Square Garden, mainly uh, Philadelphia would come in. When they came in, he would go over and work on a stick with no shirt on. And those guys are all coming in and saying, yeah, Nicky's got that look and everything too. And he puts the Vaseline on his face. Oh, he's got to go to a boxing match. And it worked. Yeah, you can tell the guys are like, I'm not going to mess with it. My wife bothers. Exactly. Yeah. Let, let him sleep tonight, boys. And it's like yeah. perfect. If you get in their head that way, then it's a mellow game. You know, it's yeah. just, it works out in your favor and you get the job done without having to do anything. But it definitely takes a few years of yeah. doing some wild things that, that yeah. plants a seed in those people's minds that it's like, yeah, let him sleep tonight. Don't wake him up. He wakes up, then we're all going to be in trouble. Who who was your first fight against in the NHL? <laughs> Tony Twist. Oh, oh, wow. oh wow! Twister. Twister. Yes, yeah, Twister. He he was a strong man. Uh, you know, this was back when, um, you know, I think he was taking the rain over. I mean, I don't know if you really take the rain over from Probert, but um, you know, like Twister was really coming up and really hurting guys. Um, uh, but. Yeah, that, that was my first fight. And then uh, my third fight was actually Bob. Um, so, uh, you know, Proby. But uh, that didn't go the way I wanted to, but I learned a lot in that fight. So, And uh, the, the reigning heavyweight champ, was you even say it's Bob Probert at that time? Yeah, I mean, for Proby, you know, just Bob Probert in general. I mean, you just, you know, you never sleep on him and he's always game and He's the one guy, one of the guys I looked up to, you know, when I was younger too. It wasn't really a role I played, but you look at a guy like that and you think, holy cow, you know, that's a teammate. That's somebody who protects and gives them, you know, gives his, his players a lot more room to do their job. So I, uh, once I started throwing down, then I kind of said, well, I want to be more like that guy, <laughs> you know? Right. So right. where a lot, a lot of the kids look, I want to be, you know, Wayne Gretzky back in the day, but I'm like, hey, Bob Prover, look at what he does. So he was, he was a big part of it. And, uh, you know, just... You know, him being my third fight, uh, I, like, like I tell everybody, I learned a lot from that. Uh, I know a lot of people had opinions about it. Uh, a lot of people commented about it. Didn't like what I did, but Proby understood. You know, he had done the job long enough, and he had had that done to him, and he had done that Why, to me. Uh, what happened? What happened in the fight? Basically, uh, you know, we swear, I, it's funny, earlier in the game, I think it was 0-0. It was in McNichols back in the day, um, my first season in 98, and uh, I'm out on the ice with Bob Prober. So I'm like, Proby, we going to go? we going to go? He's like, not enough. He's like, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, no, no, okay. <laughs> and, you know, I'm just, you know, I think we're winning, I think four to one in the third period and I'm skating down the ice and I feel this tap tap. And, and I turn around and he's like, we want to go kid. I was like, okay. And basically <laughs> just drop them in and all respectful and everything, grab a hold and uh, I'm doing pretty good. You know, I'm kind of, I grabbed him, uh, the jersey, you know, kind of punching him and, I was doing pretty good. Then I was like, I'm going to re-grab. And when I did, he lifted his arm and I grabbed him in his armpit and whoops, you know, he basically, you know, teed off, hit me three or four times and knocked me down to a knee. I got back up and I wasn't in my body. And basically I put him in a smoke hold and I would not let go. Uh, the refs were trying to break my hold. They were hitting my hand. They were doing everything they could to break my grip. And they just said, all I was saying was no, no, no. And then basically dead Marsh and Audrey's come over to me and, you know, grab a hold of me, Parksy, Parksy, Parksy. And then I was like, hey, boys, what's up? And then I basically came back into my body. I let go of Proby, and I was like, oh, shit, what did I just do? And his jersey was like down to his his, his jock strap at that point. And I was like, oh, no, he's going to hate me. He's going to kill me now. He, you know, nothing really happened that game. But the next game we played each other, you know, I'm facing off, and Proby's out there. So I'm like, oh, here we go. So I'm like, you know, hey, Proby, sorry about, you know, that first tilt against you. I know you probably hate me. I want to kick my ass. But. You know, I apologize. And he's like, kid, I've been there more times than not. You're going to have a great career. Keep up the good work. And, you know, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it was just really cool to have that, that correspondence with a guy like that, that, you know, really respects. And he, and he knows he's been there before and it's happened to him. So, sure. you know, he's not going to, you know, dummy, dummy me down or, or try to degrade me. Um, so it was just a really cool uh, correspondence with them uh, on the ice. And, you know, other than that, I only fought him once. You know, I, I didn't. You know, I probably, you know, probably should have fought him again, but in hindsight, I was just like more respectful at that point because right. of what he was dead. And, and it was just that, that, that pecking order, you know, you got to give, you got to give kudos to guys that were there before you and, and really paved the way for you. So. Oh. Did you enjoy fighting? Um, at times I did a lot of the times, I mean, I would, I would love to have played, you know, like I said, 10, 15 minutes a game and a football game, you know, or if a, a fight had to happen, then you answer the bell. But 
you know, just sitting there or running scenarios through your head or, you know, I, I would fight guys a thousand times in my head before I'd even drop the mitts with them. And some guy, some nights I would get scraps and I wouldn't even get to, you know, play against that guy or even fight him. So sure. I'd always put my body and my mind and my mental state so much more in a racket because I never let myself calm down because I was always just right. wired and ready. And that was kind of a hard, hard thing to kind of get used to, but then it's survival and it's a job that you want to keep and you have to continue to do it to keep the job. So you just kind of go with the flow. Um, do you think know, I, the good coaches, do you think the good coaches really understand the role? They play you a little bit more, right? So you're definitely yeah, one. Exactly that. And they always want you to be proactive, not reactive. And the only way you can do that is being on the ice and being effective and not always just fighting. It's, you know, it's, 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 you know, finishing your check or, it's just being there. If a scrum happens and then nothing breaks out of it, or if it does, then I'm the one that's throwing down. So a lot of those things come into play. Um, and I remember one game I played against Minnesota. I had three assists. Uh, I think I had a fight. I was first star that night. Uh, ten and a half minutes I played. I, I thought it was great, too. And then I get called into Bob's office, and he says, you know, that's not your job. You know, I, I didn't put out there for that. And I was like, did we not win the game? Did anybody get hurt? Did I do my job? You know, basically, you know, I was, you know, still young at that time, so I couldn't tell them to fuck off, but I was just like, this is bullshit. Like, we're supposed to be a team. Like, how can we be a team if we have somebody like you at the helm that's just running this thing off, off, the, off the cliff? Yeah. So, did guys like did guys like Sackick or Forsberg ever grab you, pull you aside and say, hey, we respect what you're doing. We appreciate it. Uh, well, right, not really at the time, but, you know, the guys like, like Adam Foote, you know, they would come to me and say, you know, Harks, you get, you give the guys a lot more room out here, you know, keep doing your job, you know, keep it up. And, you know, I would talk to Forsberg, uh, back in the day and, and he really enjoyed it too, because, you know, he's like Parksy, you know, when you're not, when you're not in the lineup, I have two feet of ice to play in and do my job. in. he says, when you're on the bench or in the lineup that night, I had six feet. Right. So I have a lot more room to do my job when I don't have those flies on my back because you're on the bench and you could possibly come off that bench. So, you know, that was really cool to hear too, that I was able to give guys a little bit more room and a little more time to do their job and be more successful as well. Because at the end of the day, we need those two points and that's, that's the, that's the, that's the end result. And, you know, you want that really good standing at the end of the year and you want to be able to have, you know, a good, you know, first, you know, through fourth round. So, um, the easier we can make it ourselves, the better we're going to be in the long run. So, you know, it's, you know, for, when you're telling those stories, it's funny because I think back when we played the Islanders all the time, they had Clark Gillies and Bob Nystrom, right? Two big killers. Oh. And when, when they were in the lineup, I, it wasn't like you were afraid uh, when they were in the lineup. It's just you were more aware, like you just said. So, like, if I want to run into Bob, uh, Mike Bossy all night, if those two guys are not in the lineup, I'm going to hit Bossy a lot more, right? They Clark are. Gillies is on there. Yeah. Oh, and you're right, too. They need just the stare. You don't have to, like, you build that reputation. You don't have to do a whole lot. It's just really the luck out there, right? And you have Exactly. To yeah, you just got to plant the seed. Like I said, 80 mental, 20 physical. You know, if you can get in somebody's head, the body follows. So, you know, that is a big part of the game. And some of the stuff that I don't really see these days because they put it in the stripes or the NHL's hands on, oh, this guy did this, and so now we're just going to fight him. Instead of having a big brother figure on that team like Reeves or anybody else these days, and it's like, you touch my guys and I'll rip your head off. You'll never play another game in this, you know, league again because I will make sure that you're hurting so bad that your family feels it. So <laughs> we just played, you just played that seed. And like, and if you follow through from time to time that people are like, oh, he means business. You know, like the time I tried to jump the, the, the glass in, in San Jose when I was playing there after, you know, the Nashville team, you know, it's just like, you get to a point where you're like, you know, I'm fed up and I'm just tired of people poking. So the, the cage Wait, is can, open and I'm going to roar. Can we back up and give a little more context to that story? Oh yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, that, that was that was a good one. Because what's funny too is got I we got to know Brendan Witt after uh, we all retired. So, uh, but didn't know him at the time. Uh, but he had just gotten traded to Nashville from Wash, uh, and uh, and basically, I think he told the whole team in, in the in the room was just like let Parker sleep tonight. Like whatever you do, like I just got here. I don't want anything to happen. Like let's just have a good game and let's just you know move to the next city, and. Jordan Tutu didn't get the memo, and you know I'm skating up the ice, and this little kid's whacking me on the back of my legs. I was like, "Toots, quit it! You know, quit hit me, quit when you're making your anger at me." And then I just was like, "You know what? Done." Boom! He flipped the switch on me, and I just went back and threw an elbow and caught him, and then he goes slight into the corner. And I don't know if he was selling it more than than I caught him, but 
I was like, fine, one down, one to go. So basically he's getting right over to the, the, the goalie. And I was like, you want to go? And the goalie's like, go oh, where? He's like, I'm going to tune you up. And he's like, no, no. And then Shea Weber, like he, he actually played in Kelowna after I did. And I look over and I was like, you want to go? And he's like, no. <laughs> and that's the I look over at the rep. I'm like, you want to go? He's like, I've had enough of you, Parker. Get the hell out of here. And I basically go to the penalty box and I was cleaning off my stick. And, and basically the ref was like, you know what? I've had enough of you out of here. And I get halfway across the ice and I just, I black out. I don't really know what happened after that, but obviously watching the video, I get onto the bench and I'm going down the tunnel. I'm like, you know what? Watch this. And that's basically what I have tattooed here is watch this. Oh, that's where they came from. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the sayings. Uh, so I was like, you know what? I'm, I've had enough. So I go to jump over the glass. There's the partition and the glass right in the middle of the two boards. And I jump up onto that thing, trying to get over and me and Winter are swinging at each other and Darcy Gordon Chuck's on the other bench and, it turned into a melee, and I'm like, here we go. And then I got uh, my goal, my my backup goal, I think Schaefer at the time. So Schaefer was grabbing me and pulling me down, and a couple other guys were, and the ref was. And the glass almost broke. I was like, come on, just something, go our way. Like, just if this glass goes, like, it's on. And they pulled me down, and I was like, son of a bitch. So I get in the locker room, and everything happens. Nothing really, you know, took off from that. But basically, I told Schaefer, I said, the next time that happens, don't pull me back. Push me over. Like, what guy with team injury do? Like, holding me back like that. Like, you got to push my ass over the boards. And he was like, mm, shit. Oh, but, you know, it, yeah, but it's just like, it's just that aggression and that, that energy and hockey. And I even say it these days, I don't want to have more emotion in the stands than they do on the ice. So, I, I mean, if we go, people want to go for a show, they want to see things they've never seen before and they want to see emotion and they want to see people who give a shit. And I was definitely one of those players that, you know, that was. One one of the things I brought to the table was I did give a shit. They were my teammates, and they were my to protect. And if somebody did something stupid, I'd raise the bar and say, "Not tonight." Yeah. You know, one of the things I always thought, one of the things I always thought was cool. I, I saw. I won't mention the guy's name, but he does a color commentating. Um, Just say his name, Tom. It was Mike my, Mike Johnson that does the stuff up in Canada for you know. And when he played, he was kind of like a skilled third line guy. He wasn't really a tough guy at all. And he was asked on a uh, during during a game. I think somebody got up. Got to fight. The team wasn't playing well. It might have been Darren Langdon, who was a client of mine. And the team wasn't playing well, so he went out and got in a fight, trying to get things going, or stir the pot a little bit. And the, and the uh, play-by-play guy asked Mike Johnson, he says, "Does that work?" And Johnson goes, "Nah, that doesn't work." And I was like, "Well, that means you're not a very good teammate, right?" Because yeah, that's our job as other players. So if you go out there and you start start a fight to get something going, and then we don't follow up with that, I mean, that's bad yeah. teammates on our on our side, right? And when he said that, I was like, oh, "That's why you were really mess with a player." So yeah, that's why you got what you got. Yeah, but yep. I mean, getting those stick taps and getting the boys up on the bench and yeah. them like yeah. whack, 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 whack. I mean, yep. it does, like, the big thing is momentum shifts. So, like, we always say, you know, north to south, we want to tilt the ice so it's easier for us. So, let's tilt the ice. Let's get the momentum. And if they're walking all over us, like, watch this. We're going to change the momentum, boys. What, you know, and you go and you tune someone up and then you make that team just a little bit smaller. Yeah. Then you get a little bit bigger. And then before you know it, it becomes easier. And then you have all the momentum. You're playing your game. They're having to play your game that you want to bring to the ice that night. So that's a big part of it. And guys that don't see it or weren't a part of that or, or couldn't make that adjustment in the games, yeah. you know, you can definitely tell, you know, why they're they, not they going win. Yeah. Yeah, they're not going to yeah, be a winning team. It's probably right. Yeah. So, so, okay, so you win the cup. What are you, you win the cup? 01. 01 with Colorado, correct? Right? Yeah, yeah, with Colorado. So, like, Ray Bork, uh, Patty Waugh, Forsberg, all those boys. I mean, that was. Wow, that's right. Yeah. They beat the Devils that year. Yeah, yeah, we were game seven, yeah, against the Devils. Yep. Wow, that's I remember that. that's a good hockey. And that's the year they handed the trophy to Ray Bork after they won it, right? That was they did. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Joe, Joe took it from Batman and basically gave it right to Ray, and then Ray hoisted it for the first time in twenty-two years. So that's that was pretty, pretty cool. Special to be off so here. I mean, the emotions and what you could feel on the ice that night was just everything was right. So yeah, yeah how was the party? How was Denver? Honestly, I don't remember that party, but fortunately back, you know, a couple of years ago when the Avs won, they brought all the alumni back. So I got to enjoy that, got to be on a float. So I got to enjoy a little bit more of it than, you know, being a 20, you know, 21, 22 year old, not really knowing any better to be in, you know, later in, later in age and going, oh, this is really cool. And look how embracing and how cool the town is and how much everybody is just a part of this. So, yeah. So when you first lift the cup, it's got to be quite a feeling, right? It's like you grew up dreaming of winning the Stanley Cup playing the NHL. 
Definitely. Yeah. But plus, I mean, I think, I don't know if it was the stars or the Red Wings, but back in the day, like Kelowna had a lot of, a lot of those boys lived up there, Penticton, yeah. 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 West Bank, all that side. But a lot of the guys were there. So a lot of the years, those teams would win the cup. So they'd bring the cup to Kelowna. And every time that would happen, I was out of there. I was like, I ain't going to look at it. I ain't going to smell it. I ain't going to touch it until I hoist that. Like, oh, ain't going to happen. It's, it's that, you know, it's that, that, that whole code. Yeah, the code. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and back in the day, it was like, I ain't messing this up. So I did everything I could. And then, you know, it was just meant to be at all one, the team we had. And, you know, I think we won the president's uh, trophy that year, you know, best team in the league. I mean, we just rolled. I mean, it was just yeah. meant to be. Everybody, you know, picked up Alex, Alex Tange to to Chris Drury to all the boys that that really stepped up in, in his playoff runs and and really brought it. So it was cool to see. And that was the year we, we lost Forsberg to a, to a swing, you know, almost erupting. So we lost him, and then other guys stood up, you know, stepped up. So it was just meant to be. That's the only thing that Forsberg and I have in common. I lost my swing, so I had a spleen injury. That's about the only thing we have in common. He was talented, mm-hmm. only man. Uh, yeah, that was that was tough. He he looked like Casper the the ghost that night. Oh, was he? We were out afterwards, and yeah, it was there's something not right. And luckily, the I think one of the doctors or something saw him, and then they touched him in the right spot and made him jump. So they're like, "We're taking you now." So luckily, I had had good people that were that were looking after him. So right, wow. So what the cup? And that's that. Yeah, you know, I played for eleven years. I love my career and all that, but not winning the cup, man. It's, Especially when you talk to guys like you did have won the cup and it's like, oh man, I'd have loved to do that. It's cool. Yeah. It, 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 yeah, it was pretty, pretty, pretty crazy and pretty magical. And what's crazy is like talking to D Mac. He's like, Parks, you got one, but I have four. I was like, screw you, D Mac. <laughs> D Mac, he's yeah. great. Oh, Darren McCarty from the Rebel. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 So we got to know him and Kosher and a bunch of the boys after the fact yeah. as well with all the other night games and just the rivalries we had back in the day. It's amazing oh, yeah. how. You know, you could be really good friends with those guys because you went to bat. You, we didn't go to war against each other, but we battled so hard oh, yeah. that you can respect guys like that. And you know, I remember having him sitting down at a table with Adam Foot and being like, "Footy, you made me even a better player because how hard you play made me play that much harder against you." So it raised my game. So it's right. it's kind of cool the kudos you get from different teams may may not be teammates, but different teams that you played against that that really raised the bar to make you play, make you the player you were. It's amazing, right? How barbaric the game was back then, the fights and everything, all the stuff we would do to each other. And then after the game, oh. we'll see each other like 10, 15, 20 years later. It's like your best friends, right? It's like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, you battle so hard, but you can respect the guy like that. And yeah. guys yeah. that wanted to win it. Oh, so I mean, you know, that, that were, yeah. Yeah. That was some battle. You, Tom, your battles with the Islanders were legendary, but yeah. Red Wings Avalanche was yeah. next level. That was crazy, that rivalry. And so what, what year was it there when, uh, what's his name, uh, Lemieux hit uh, Draper in the boards, was that? That was actually, I think it was 99, because that was the year that I was down at Hershey the whole year, oh. and I never got called up, so I, I wasn't able to do anything about that, but then after the fact, you know, getting called up and, and having the Red Wings and that whole rivalry, I mean, it's kind of too late to deal with it then, but, you know, it's just, I knew what had happened, and, you know, it wasn't going to happen again on my, my watch, to tell you that. But, uh, you know, I know Lemieux really liked it when I came onto the team. He was like, Parksy, you'll be my new friend. And he was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, let's go, bud. Yeah, let's go, really. bud. Yeah, but, but guys that really respect you because you do that job and you can't keep them safe, right. they, they know that. So that that's a big part of it as well is, is getting that call up or getting that, that, that one-way contract and being able to stay up and not worry about you know, eating cold spaghetti on the back of the bus, and we're like, oh, here I go again. So, you know, Lemieux was Lemieux was that y- yappy guy too, Lemieux, right? He was always yapping. He came up. Oh yeah, the play- yeah. We played them in the playoffs when he was in Montreal, and I went to hit him one time, and he rocked me. He knocked me back, and he he's over top of me with the French accent. He says, hey, run into a wall. I'm <laughs> sister. So, <laughs> then next time he comes to hit me, I cross check him right across the ear. And I says, oh, yeah. did you run? Did you run into a fence? Yeah. <laughs> So it's pretty good. He gave him back pretty good, too. He was, he was good. He was a good player. He played hard. Scott, who gave, the, who gave you the name the Sheriff? Oh, my God. I got, Well, the funny story is that I got that in, in Hershey. And that was actually the Helen Hershey is what they called it. But it was the Kentucky Brawl. So we had actually had a guy, Troy Crowder. Uh, oh, yeah. He was tough, too. Very tough. So Crowds was on our team. Um, his mom just happened to be at the game that night. So Crowds is 
another guy I kind of looked looked up to as well. And you know, probably one of the ones that got the better of Probert more than once. But yep. I wouldn't say he took the rain away from Proby, but he would definitely give Proby some some uh, some tough nights. But um, you know, so Crowds is on the team, and uh, we were playing Kentucky, and Garrett Brunette uh played for Kentucky back in the day and um you know a tough guy uh fought everyone every night didn't matter uh he'd fight you in the parking lot after the game too he didn't care uh but yeah Bernie he basically uh you know kind of kind of jumped crowds a little bit but then you know they kind of went to the ice uh the refs were thinking okay it's over so the one ref had let go of Burnett's arm to go step over him so he didn't you know cut anybody stepping on him and when he let go of his arm, that's when Bernie came down and just sucker punched crowds, bang, banged his head off the ice, and I can tell he was almost out of it. And I, I, I just, I'm thinking his mom's five throws up in the stands right there watching her son get getting taken out. So I look at Mike Felino. I says, "Can I go? Can I go?" And he goes, "No, no, 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 no." And I'm looking at Burnett crossing the ice, just just mean mugging me, and I'm just thinking like, not in my bar, not tonight. I says, "Can I go? Can I go?" I don't know if Felino said no, no, or go, go. I, I grabbed Bruce Craig. I grabbed Bruce Richardson right next to me. So Richie, I grabbed him, boop, threw him on the ice. First on the ice, I was like, "Oh, it's go time, boys!" So I jumped him, <laughs> and I did just seriously. Did you really put. Hold on, you really pushed him on the ice. Oh, really? good idea. Yeah, yeah, number twenty-two. You can watch the video or anything. So Bruce Richardson. So I grabbed oh, Richie. I grabbed him, and I was like, "Boop!" Right on the ice. And I was like, first thing I was like, "I'm stuck." Eight. So I jumped the boards, and I just, I wheeled down in front of Kentucky's bench. And they all kind of backed up and be like, oh, shit. And Burnett saw me coming, so he actually kind of hurried up the ice and they closed the door. And I just went like, what? I was at it. So I just started, I said, if I ever got in this predicament or if this ever happened, what would I do? I took my tie down off and just started stripping. I was like, they're going to have anything to hold on to. And I'm like, what am I really going to do? Give me an extra two minutes? Ooh, a 10-minute penalty? Ooh, ooh, ooh. So I just stripped down. And by this time, both benches had emptied. Uh, they're all on the ice. Everybody's fighting. Goalies are fighting. Mark Denis fighting. Um, uh, Evgeny Nabokov. So all these boys were just throwing down. And I'm just skating around. So once I get all my stuff off, I'm just thinking like, okay, who's going to be first? So I see one of my boys in the corner, Billy Neiman, in, you know, in, in a fight. So I'm thinking, hmm, that guy just hit Nemo. I said, I'm going to go hit him back. So I, I just basically go over to him and just, bam, just nail this guy and put him down. And then Nemo gets on top of him. So Christian Gosling comes over to me and, you know, starts to throw down. So I grab him and, like, hit him three or four times and knock him to the ice. I put my knee on his chest. I start the lawnmower in his face. And I'm just doing work, doing absolute work. I'm thinking, oh, I may, I may, I may just flatten his skull out. There just may be brains and stuff everywhere. But it doesn't happen that way. Not like the movies. So I was thinking, oh, if I can make this reality, but not re- not reality, but uh, I tried to put my fist through his face. Basically, he kind of left him there for a little bit, then he woke back up. So I'm skating around, just kind of, you know, tuning a few more people up, and then Gosling comes back over to me again. I was like, are you stupid? Like, all right, she's still asleep on the ice. So I grab him again, and basically just start teeing off him again, and then both refs, I think I went, yeah, I was actually throwing lust at the time, so both refs are just jumping my left arm. So I go, ha ha, I got you. And he was bent over like halfway and his ribs were right here. So I was like, bam, hit him as hard as I could. He spit out a bunch of blood. And basically they opened up the Zamboni door and kick him off the ice. He's Bambi on the concrete out there down. And then I'm just skating around the ice a little bit more. And the refs grabbed me, pushed me over to the bench. And I'm talking to Felino. And Felino's like, hey, Parks, you're good, you're good. You know, just we'll leave the ice. And I left the ice, but then right when I left the ice, they started back up again. So I came back on the ice and when I did, everything just stopped again. So I got my point across to where I was like, there you go. Didn't have enough. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll do this again. So, and that was Helen Hershey. And what's funny too is that was San Jose's farm team. And then I get traded from the abs to San Jose in 04, 05, one of those years. And I'm playing with all those guys now. So they had known me prior being at Hershey. And I was like, Boy, I'm on your team now. So if that shit happens, I get your back. So they're like, "Oh, thank God!" So, <laughs> yeah. Is that where you got the sheriff then? Is that where you got the sheriff? Yeah, it was basically yeah, it was basically in Hershey, and basically you know they just said, "Oh, the sheriff is flashing his badge." Oh, the sheriff's and you know the sheriff's doing work, and very cool. You know that's basically where where it, where it, you know 
Okay. So what's what's your best fight in the NHL? Oh my gosh. Mm, well, yeah, actually, Stu was pretty good. I, I fought the Grim Reaper. And what's crazy about uh, Stu Grimson was uh, during this fight, he actually <laughs> broke my nose before the fight even started by just punching me with his glove on. So that's what pissed me off and flipped the switch. And I was like, if you're going to do that, Stu, then I'm going to do this. So I grabbed him and basically just one punch and just he went right down. So that, 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 was, that was pretty good to do that to the Reaper, even though I, I respected him and fought him enough time to know that he's a large human and does his job very, very, very well. Uh, and somebody you can learn a lot from. So uh, that was definitely, you know, one of my good ones. But I actually fought, my second fight I didn't tell you was actually uh, your boy, uh, Langdon. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it has Langdon. But trying to fight him, though, too, his cardio was so good. Yeah. That, you know, he could, you know, he could kind of rope it up a little bit. And then, you know, the guys tire out. And he's like, gotcha. And then, but I had really good cardio back in the day, too. So that's one of the, you know, one of the good fights, you know, we had back in the day that, oh. that I remember about. All right. So I have to ask you that. What was your worst fight? Uh, probably just Proby, just because everybody, everybody that had opinions and thought, oh, look at this kid. Oh, he's a scrub. Oh, oh, he's a piece of shit. Oh, they just, they just had every name under the, under the world for me. But when I talked to the guy I fought against and he has respect for me, but these guys don't, I have no respect for them because they're not doing our jobs. They're, they're just minions out there that, probably couldn't even fucking fight their way out of a wet paper bag to save their lives anyway. So who are they to judge? But, you know, it's one of those, I mean, I'm glad I didn't play in the social media era because, you know, they, they wouldn't like me very much. You know, the cancel culture would probably already canceled me years ago, but, um, you know, it is it's what it is. Like pe people don't realize how tough that job is. When I first retired, I got in the age business and war, war record was a client of mine. And he banged around the miners for a little bit. I just left LA. So I knew they didn't have any, I think that Jay Miller had uh, got traded, retired or whatever. Marty may get traded. So I was able to get Warren a, a tryout in LA. And I told him, I said, listen, I hate to say this to you. If you're going to play in the NHL. You have to fight everybody that moves when you go to training. And, uh, he, he did that. Cause I remember like, uh, I don't, I wouldn't want somebody to say that to me. I, again, I just don't realize, uh, if, I don't think people realize just how tough that job is, right. To do it all the time. I mean, you're a big man. Uh, you, like you, you've talked a few times too about how you snap. Now, not all fighters are like that. Like you mentioned, Langdon, he was more under control, right? Like you more would really lose your temper, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I basically like my wife says she has a dimmer switch. Mine's on and off. It's basically there's there's no in between. There's no happy media. It's either I'm mellow or it's it's shit back crazy. So um, that's just something I had where I kind of call it mom strength. You know, where you flip the switch and. You know, the mom can lift that car up, pull her baby out with her other hand, and then drop the car. It's just, you just have that snap mode to where I went into a different place. And I think to do the job we did, I mean, we're hurting people. We're ending people's yeah. careers. I think Sandy McCarty, I think I might have been his last fight. You know, it was just, you know, you look at certain things and things you do, and you kind of have to be able to put a wall up because, you know, you may not be killing the person but you may be killing their career you may be ending their career you may be sending them on a different path so it takes a lot to be able to kind of swallow that too even though like west garth ended my career so you know it is what it is you know kevin west garth in, in la we we're playing exhibition and he uppercutted me you know caught me good and at that point you know I, I was pretty much you could throw a toothpick at me and knock me out where you know when i broke into league you hit me over the head of the two by four and i would laugh at you and just go to work. So what did you, you know, get a concussion? A concussion from that? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Basically, I, I was dealing with a lot of concussion stuff, and uh, you know, one of the big things was taking the puck in the ice hockey. Gate. I think it was no five in San Jose. It was like four game, four days before the season was going to start in practice, and normal practice, everything was good. One of my boys went to do a button hook and then passed it to me, and next thing I know, I'm I'm down to one knee and my head is throbbing. I'm just like, what the shit's going on? And, I thought somebody was behind me and they had actually swung and like bat balls, you know, baseball swung me to like take my job. So I was thinking, oh, it's on. I was like, somebody's going to do that. They're going to get the hammer now. So I didn't realize it was my trainer behind me that was grabbing a hold of me. And I get up and I'm just, I'm losing my shit. I'm about to throw down with everybody. And it was actually the puck. You know, I, I went to go one time it. And it hit a divot on the ice and hit my shaft and shot right up, hit me in the orbital bone or hit me in the ice socket. 
basically broke my eye socket in two or three spots. Uh, my nose uh, actually gave me a, bru a bruise my brain stem when it hit me, um, which I found out after the fact. Uh, and basically just it just it created kind of all of this. So <laughs> I have one eye that's kind of normal and then I have this. So it's basically just it, it took a big blow and it took me a, a lot to recover from. And I tried to come back a couple of times that year and even like trying to body check just the jarring motion, just the just the just the, the shaking just brought it on so much faster. And it kind of sucked that something like that compared, you know, you know, as well as all the fights I had, you know, just yeah, I mean, it is what it is. How are you now? Any effects from concussions? Um, some, but you know, I've definitely more good days than bad these days. So with, which is good, but we also did that by, by creating our, our companies that we have, uh, our hip companies, our taboo social club, um, and just having an alternative to big pharma because a lot of the stuff they were trying to put me on back in the day just made me more sick, you know, would give me actually more, more headaches or they would give me, you know, thump, 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 and then the migraines and then the lightning bolts. And then before you know it you know, possible seizure. So it was just that bad at the time, but I didn't really want to take anything. I really couldn't take anything because my body didn't accept it. So I needed an alternative at that point and there really wasn't anything. So after I retired, we started these companies and it's just amazing how, how that stuff can help. And it, it, it's not psychoactive. It's, it's, you know, hemp drive with, with our herbs that we, that we blend in there as well. So it's like a tea bag. Uh, but it's smokable, um, we call it smokable wellness is basically what we, what we call it. So, um, you know, to be able to do that and actually be able to feel better. I mean, it, it's amazing night and day. Uh, and I really, I really believe in that stuff too. I, I agree with you. Get away from the pharmaceuticals and do it all natural stuff. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. It's uh, Scott, Scott does some good stuff with the veterans too. You're a big advocate for veterans, which is pretty amazing. Definitely. Yeah. 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 We have our Parker's platoon as well. So we do that. We help uh, uh, guys and girls transition when they, when they come out and, uh, and basically just show them everything they fought so hard for, you know, a lot of the stuff's just as easy as getting them up in the hills and get them on a side by side or going for a walk or taking them out hunting or, you know, snowmobiling, just being able to, to enjoy everything they fought so hard for because our, our, our lands are beautiful. So let's go enjoy them. And, and basically that's a lot of stuff they don't get to enjoy because, you know, the stories we hear is, you know, them trying to get to the VA or, or can't find a parking spot. So they're driving around the VA 10 times trying to find a parking spot and then they can't find it. And then they just drive home. So little, little I think the, the little, um, the little wins that we get by, by getting them out and getting them in the now is kind of what we call it. Cause you know, they may be 11, five years ago where, Everything was really bad, and they just continue to to go down the wrong road instead of looking at the positives in their lives and showing them things that that are really enjoyable and a lot of fun things out there. So yeah, very cool, very cool, great job by you. Were you connected to the military somehow? Oh, uh, my dad, he was uh, a gunner in a helicopter in Nome. So hearing his stories, you know, he's not one that really tells a lot of the sto stories, but the stories he does tell, I really listen to because that 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 time and that era was really really tough on the military and the men and women serving because you could be proud of what you did and you know it wasn't yeah. their war to fight it you know they're just there trying to protect us in our homeland and so you know it, it's you know unfortunate that they had to do what they did but you know seeing how the military is treated now and there's a lot more uh a lot more people out there that are that are on their sides and, and understand because a lot of people have family members that are yep. active and or veterans and or uh, a part of it and you know they see the struggles and they see what they go through and um like i said those those little wins go a long way on an everyday great that's a great job by you that's fantastic you know more people should yeah i think we all should I, i've met a few military people now and i ask them i said is it okay if i go up and see somebody wearing a military hat or shirt or something can i go up and thank them for the service and say oh yeah by all means i had one guy i was in costco the other day uh I think he's a vet, Vietnam veteran. And I walked up to him. I said, hey, thanks, thanks for your service. I shook his hand. He goes, eh, I was in the area. He was, <laughs> it was so funny. He was just like, he was so casual about it. He was a good guy. So very funny. Yeah. But listen, I, yeah. So listen, I, I got to tell you, we, I, I love these shows where I've really never met the person before that I'm interviewing. And you were one of those guys. Great story with your life. I you had to fight literally and figuratively to get to the National Hockey League and have a great career. Win a Stanley Cup too. So I'm jealous. Great yeah. to meet you. And wait, wait on that note, Scott, where's, where's, the, where's, the, where's the ring? Oh, the ring's actually back in Colorado. So 
Yeah, we're down here in Florida right now, but yeah, it's back in Colorado. And like the wife says, I don't wear it out enough, but it's just not really. I mean, luckily it's not too gaudy. It's not like I'm wearing, you know, you know, a city on my hand, like some of the rings are these days, but it's actually a perfect size to be able to wear out and be able to enjoy. And, you know, you know, I guess the, you know, a big part of this as well is really, you know, even my wife and son, you know, they're, they're a big part of my, you know, my, my transition after hockey into the real life. And, um, you know, I couldn't have done it without them. No, what do we call it? No more time. Recalibrate. Re we, we recalibrate. There you go. Calibration. I like that. Re wife, re wife's <laughs> taking charge there. The wifey's taking charge. Exactly. Yeah. We got to use the, yeah, the proper terminology is, yeah, I don't want people thinking that it was, yeah. Yeah. I don't look good in a skirt, my wife. <laughs> Wait, have you tried to do it? Maybe you never know. No, no, no. I've never been there. No, nope, not even during the hazing days back in the day. That's right. Too. That's right. Oh, so Scott, it's great to meet you. Thank you very much for coming on the show. You're a great man. Seriously. Thanks so much. So, thank you guys. Really appreciate you. Take care. Yeah, we'll see you again. Oh, that was a fun, uh, fun, uh, rousing trip there down memory lane with Scott Parker, man. That was awesome. Well, he's a good storyteller, right? Like, oh, fight there. <laughs> fight Bob Probert and all the stuff he did. He's good. He's a great person. Now, that's, and again, we've talked about this before. We've been doing more of these shows that I don't know the person. Yes, we just don't always talk about their life. But I think it's even better in some ways because I, I think it definitely is because it seems you have that more of that sense of wonder when you hear the story. I mean, you have the, you relate, obviously, as a hockey player, but you get that, you know, it's cool to hear it, to feel back the, you know, credits yeah. and see someone's real story. And that was awesome. He, uh, family's cool. They're doing some, some yeah. things for wellness, which you you like that you yeah. have mental health, you know. Yeah. Well, like, help the veterans and all that kind of stuff. He's good. He's quick to man. Uh, he's uh, I, I was dying. He's telling a story about the Hershey brawl. Oh my gosh! It, it was it Helen Hershey. Is everything Helen? And you can look it up. They, the, his son DJ sent us the uh, the link on YouTube. It, oh, there's a whole yeah. There's a lot. There's a, you, a lot of video on Scott Parker. If you want to go see him brawl with people, he's an old school yeah. forcer. You know, you don't just get telling the stories about the intimidation part. You don't even have to necessarily fight. You build the reputation. That's just very, that's, very, very, that's what you want. Yeah, you don't want to, if you don't have to fight every single yeah. night, you just people know, I don't want to mess with this guy. That's a great story. He's funny. And that's the story we can have on. We're going to have him on again later yeah, to talk more fighting stories. And we'll definitely, because you know, a lot of people like love these guests. We'll get them back on. So absolutely, great story, great show. No accents. Sure. No accents. All right, laddie. Oh, there it is. All right, grasshoppers. Thank you for listening. We had a fantastic show. We'll see you next time.